morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm sitting in Dublin. This is the Institute of International and European Affairs, another webinar. And today we have the privilege and uh, pleasure of hosting Eve Mersch. And I'm going to have a conversation with Eve. Eve is, as you all know, uh, he's a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. And in, in that capacity, he is vice chair of the uh, supervisory board of the single supervisory mechanism of the ECB. So we're going to have a, a discussion this afternoon. It's going to be on the record. You have the opportunity to use the Q&A function to uh, call in some questions. So when we've sort of run out of our discussion, we'll give you some time to have your, your questions. I, I'll, I'll pitch some of the questions that, that we get um, to Eve and continue in that way. Uh, Eve. Marsh, of course, I've known Eve for, for many years, and, and we're almost exactly the same age, so I don't have to tell you how old he is or how old I am, but we're almost exactly the same age. We were born just a few days apart. Uh, Eve's um, uh, completely different academic background to my own as an, an economist. He is a lawyer, and he studied, uh, took several degrees at the Sorbonne in Paris, even though he's a Luxembourger. Uh, I think always think of Luxembourg as having a foot on both sides of, of the uh, Franco-German uh, axis around which the euro was constructed. Eve had a very distinguished career in the public service in, in Luxembourg. He was in the Ministry of Finance. He seconded for a couple of years at the IMF. He, um, he was also seconded to in, in the role of permanent representation of, of Luxembourg at the United Nations. Uh, eventually, he became director of the Treasury. That was 89 to 98. And then the Central Bank of Luxembourg was set up in order to make sure that, that Luxembourg, as a founder member of the Euro uh, area, the Euro system, uh, would have representation at the governing council because every member of the Euro should have a central bank. So the Central Bank of Luxembourg was set up in 1998. Uh, Eve was the first governor. And he's been on the governing council of the ECB ever since. So he's the longest serving member of the governing council in two capacities. First, uh, 98 to 2012, as governor of the Central Bank of Luxembourg. And then he was appointed to the executive board in 2012. And if you count, we're now in 2020. And that means his term is coming to an end in uh, just a, a couple of months. Uh, so after the, out, outliving all other members of the governing council. Nobody has gone close to being on the governing council for 22 years. So he has an unrivaled experience and background of everything that has happened at the European Central Bank over the years. Uh, since 2019, he took, took over from uh, Sabine Lautenschläger as uh, vice chair of the supervisory uh, board, as I, I mentioned. So a, a special interest and involvement there in, in bank supervision. Eve, welcome to the Institute. And uh, Thank you for agreeing to come and discuss various topics with me. We talked about what we might talk about, and, and just to give people an idea of the topics that, that we'll probably touch on. We'll, we'll, of course, we we'll start with, with the COVID, with the uh, monetary policy um, uh, reaction of the ECB in, in handling the impacts of, of the COVID-19 crisis and fostering recovery of the euro area. Um, uh, one of those techniques was an, an additional wave of pu public um, uh, sector uh, bond purchases in, in the P uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. Um, but more generally, our second topic, I think, would be to look at the public sector purchase program, which has been in effect since 2015, and to talk about the whole question of whether this is a proportional response to the uh, challenges of maintaining inflation on the target path um, for the ECB, uh, a matter which has become the subject of, of a considerable legal debate over the last uh, uh, number of years. Then I want to move on to a, another topic which is becoming very current. And it's the whole question of technology and the disruptive effect of technology on banking, particularly in the payments area, and the whole, uh, whole question of whether the central banks and the euro uh, European Central Bank in particular, should um, think of having a digital currency, a euro digital uh, digital currency uh, 
we talk about that area. And then finally, I think we would, would like to talk a bit about the whole question of, of bankers and the personal responsibility of bankers in, in um, you know, uh, improving their performance in relation to their customers, in relation to society at large, and, and what can be done to improve that. So, monetary policy in the pandemic. Eve, what was it like when this, this crisis emerged even more rapidly than the previous crisis in 2008 and engulfed the economy, economy or economies of the, of the euro area very suddenly in, in March and there were fireworks in the, in, the, uh, in the financial markets. What was it like deciding on the reaction of the ECB at that stage to this crisis and stepping up to the plate? Well, first of all, Patrick, uh, thank you for having me uh, with the Institute. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. It is not the first time. Uh, I think the last time I have been with the Institute, we were still fellow governors uh, on the governing council so a long time ago. But uh, as you uh, just said that we are not far apart in, with our birthdays, uh, let me also present to you a happy birthday. Um, but uh, let me come to your first question. Uh, we had to some extent uh, gathered already experience with uh, a sudden crisis uh, in 2008 and 2011, which uh, to some extent were also not only a cyclical reversal, but they were coupled with a structural um, evolution and crisis. And we were also experiencing how monetary policy would be much more efficient if it would be able to interact uh, with other policy areas, uh, be it supervisory or regulatory policy for the banking sector, for the maintaining the intermediation of uh, the banking system in the economy, but also, above all, fiscal policy. And uh, at the beginning of the crisis, the biggest concern was uh, that we would have market seizures. So the obvious reaction function of a central banker is to flood the market uh, with liquidity, and that is exactly what we did. But at the same time, we also were able to interact actively with a national level to uh, start fiscal policy programs. And they became very important, especially in the dimension of extending moratoria on payment systems and also on giving uh, public guarantees. But on top, we were this time able at European level to also have a European-wide reaction on the fiscal side. And that is a first. And that was so important in creating confidence that it also contributed to the stabilization uh, attempt of the central bank in the market. We were quite successful in uh, stabilizing and freezing to some extent the economy uh, by uh, bringing forward not only asset purchase programs, but uh, also by extending uh, new long-term credit operations, uh, which gave uh, money at very fa favorable rates to those banks who lend it on to the economy. And as a consequence, uh, what would have been a very pro-cyclic reaction by the banks to stop lending was avoided. And we had uh, record uh, credit extension and also a demand for credit lines and liquidity lines from the corporate sector above all. And uh, this helped to stabilize the market. Uh, then came the second phase. Uh, the second phase uh, is, of course, still ongoing because we, on the health front, uh, we have now moved uh, into the threat of a very uh, broad-based uh, second wave. But we have also learned our lessons, how to react uh, to such uh, a pandemic. And uh, as opposed to the first uh, broad-based lockdowns, which were extremely taxing on the economy and which provoked a downfall of the economy, which was extremely large, but subsequently also a rebound, which was quite strong. 
but a rebound uh, which is not yet bringing us back to the levels where we had been. So uh, by and large, uh, I would say this time around, what was different from previous crises uh, was that the monetary policy was not only the only game in town, but was much more reinforced by the collaborative efforts uh, from the supervisory side, from the regulatory side, from the fiscal side, and also the broad-based approach uh, in the use in our instrument box, which has been anyway quite large. Um, interest rates are, were already very low going into this particular crisis. Normally, if you have a crisis uh, with a sudden shock, lock, loss of demand, uh, central banks usually reach to lower interest rates to stimulate demand. And this, in a way, wasn't uh, immediately available to you. But now, uh, the actions of the ECB do seem to have reassured markets in, in right across the euro area that interest rates will remain low for a uh, protracted period. To what extent do you think that this low interest rate environment is something that has been generated by central banks like the ECB? And to what extent do you see it really more as a, as a, a longer term trend pushed by demography, pushed by changes in saving behavior, pushed by concentration in, in wealth in different places? Inevitably, I think uh, there is an element of truth in both interpretations. It is true that uh, through central bank intervention, and especially since uh, we do not concentrate our uh, activity only to the very short term uh, level of the markets, but through the whole spectrum, uh, we have been exercising downward pressures uh, on the whole yield curve and thereby also affecting the expectations. But uh, by and large, it remains that interest rates always reflect uh, the natural rate uh, in an economy, and which is subject to uh, longer term structural effects. And uh, in all our uh, advanced economies, the natural rate has been downtrending uh, over the last um, couple of decades. And this is a trend uh, that has to do with uh, structural demographic factors, the aging of a society with lower productivity. Um, this might also uh, have to do with globalization. All this uh, has affected uh, the lower levels of inflation, but was reinforced by also uh, the action of central banks, uh, which determinedly wanted uh, to put the inflation rate down as an instrument level. This being said, we however, have been very daring at the ECB in going into negative territory, uh, which has not been uh, done uh, all over the world. Uh, and uh, the question then uh, begs, uh, what is the effective lower bound? And uh, this effective lower bound, of course, has also to do uh, with the reversal rate. Uh, from, what, from what level on? Uh, is uh, going further negative, uh, creating a reverse effect uh, by not inducing people to spend, but rather inducing them to save even more and not spending. So uh, these are, of course, questions which are very hotly debated uh, among economists. Um, there is no clear-cut uh, answer on this. But uh, we still have the instrument of the interest rate in our toolbox and it is available. And each time we take a decision and uh, we look at our toolbox and we look at what would be the instrument that would be most conducive to respond to what we would like to do. And it was in looking at our toolbox that we came to the conclusion that we left the interest rate at the level it was, but we complemented it uh, with uh, an expanded asset purchase uh, program as you know, the asset purchase is not exactly with us since 2013 because we had suspended it at one moment. Uh, then, of course, when the crisis struck, it was uh, again resumed. Uh, so we complemented also this purchase program with a specific pandemic uh, program, and uh, which was uh, also uh, specified for the pandemic in so far that it had an increased amount of flexibility compared to the constraints 
with which we had surrounded our discretion for the normal asset purchasing program. Then we had also a smaller uh, lending, uh, the lending on Teltro, as I mentioned before, was extremely large. Uh, we are in the trillions uh, of euros that were extended to the banks in, with an obligation to lend on to the economy. And um, we found that uh, these instruments have been extremely effective uh, in combating the uncertainty that was ambient and with the risks that uh, were threatening our economy and which would be a much deeper downfall and a much more uh, tentative recovery than what we have seen uh, in the figures up to now. One of the elements there and that you, you touched on is uh, the uh, kind of tiering of interest rates for those bank lending operations, which is something new this time round. Uh, the interest rates have been negative, uh, at least the deposit rate had been negative for, for quite a few years since, I guess, 2014, or it had been zero 2014. Um, anyway, uh, but now there's a tiering where, where the banks are allowed to, to borrow at an even lower rate than they would um, no, normally have expected given the structure. How, how is that working out? Is that an attempt to uh, enable the banks to continue an operation and be viable and profitable, despite the fact that negative interest rates are very damaging normally for a bank's profitability? Well, there are two elements to this tiering. One is the outright tiering, uh, where one share of the bank's reserves uh, would be exempt uh, from the negative uh, interest rate or deposit rate that we would have, if they would deposit uh, their funds with the central bank, a certain amount would be exempt from the negative rates. That is the outright theory. And that was also introduced in order to alleviate the concerns in the banking sector uh, for having downward pressure on the net interest rate margin. But then uh, what has been, in my opinion, more effective is uh, the normal conditions of our long-term uh, operations where we allow the banks uh, to borrow at even lower than our normal deposit facility under the condition, however, that they do not deposit, de redeposit the bank <laughs> with the central bank, but lend it onto the economy. And, no round tripping. Uh, this is to some extent the conditional lending, and I think in that respect it has even been more. Uh, and there, I would say the objective was less to support the profitability of the banks. Also, it is very helpful for banks' profitability, I do not deny it, but it was more to uh, be sure that we would not have a credit crunch and that the flow of credit to the economy would be maintained in difficult times. And I think this is really for lending to um, to business. It's uh, it's not for lending on on residential mortgages, which is a, a point that uh, people often notice. It, it is true, uh, although it is very difficult to control where the money is lending. Uh, I do not deny that uh, if we have had also during these difficult times a certain increase in uh, stock uh, prices and uh, in real estate prices, somehow money has also must have been flowing into those sectors. And uh, whether those mo money has been flowing exclusively outside the banking sector would be a little bit difficult to imagine. Well, you mentioned the purchase programs and, and the, in their two varieties, the original pr program, which was slowed down as you said, or stopped, and, and then the new program. Now, it was the original program, the PSPP, which was the subject of, of the Constitutional Court in Germany finding uh, earlier in, this, in the year that uh, they, they uh, concluded that the ECB really hadn't fully explained or justified themselves, or, or at least they called on the ECB in some way to, to fully justify the proportionality of this measure in response to the period of, of, of low inflation. Um, do you think that, and the ECB has made responses, or at least the Bundesbank uh, drawing on, on the ECB's work has, has made uh, responses to, um, to the various German authorities explaining why this program is proportional. Do you think that whole debate has now been put to an end and nobody can raise any problems about a public sector purchase for, for in, the, in the coming years? 
this is uh, an ongoing procedure since uh, those claimants uh, uh, now ask uh, the German Constitutional Court to have an implementing order, as they call it, uh, to see whether what they have received is satisfactory. Uh, so it's still an ongoing case in Germany, but uh, let me put straight, however, that uh, as a European institution, we only have one court, and that is the European court. That is our natural judge, and our natural judge um, has already received from the German constitutional court a prejudicial question, which means uh, a question whether this was uh, lawful and constitutional. And the European judge had uh, unamb unambiguously stated that this was fully in line uh, with the treaties and with the laws. So from that point of view, we have received the green light on the lawfulness of this purchase program. And the German constitutional court was much more criticizing the European judge than the ECB. They said the European judge had not asked us uh, sufficient questions on the proportionality. So uh, since most of our argumentation on proportionality is publicly available, we allowed the Bundesbank to share this publicly available information and to some extent also some, un, uh, some uh, documentation that was not made public but which documented exactly what has been published and to make it available to the German government and the German parliament, which were those who were attacked in the German court by the German individual claimants. And uh, the German government then looked at the documentation and they said, what we told you, German constitutional court, two years ago that we believed this was all right, we can confirm it even more on the basis of the newly made available documentation. On the documentation side, let me also underline that since the beginning of these court cases, we have issued now public accounts, which are a summary of our minutes and which contribute to uh, share with the public at large most all arguments and all uh, thinking in relation with our decision making. And this helps also to broaden our transparency and our accountability with the public at large. And most of what we had made uh, public to the, through the public accounts was then shipped also to the German government and to the German parliament. The, the, um, these purchase programs uh, have been really at the heart of the attempt by the ECB to get inflation back up to the 2%. It, it hasn't worked so far completely. I mean, inflation is still, in fact, drifting lower because of the, the, the pandemic. Now, uh, it, what's the sense in, in, in Frankfurt and around the Governing Council table about the effectiveness of these purchase programs for that um, overall attempt to boost demand and thereby uh, bring inflation back up to the close to 2% marker, uh, which is the objective. We have, of course, uh, econometric models which try to uh, calculate or to uh, assess exactly uh, what is uh, the effectiveness of our programs. And uh, what uh, we are being told uh, at the governing council level is that uh, in terms both of growth and in terms of inflation, they have been extremely effective because we would have even much lower inflation would we not have taken those <clears throat> measures. And uh, they speak of uh, amounts of like 0.8% on inflation uh, over the next year and on growth it's even a higher amount. Now, I am the first to acknowledge the limitation of uh, econometric uh, models uh, as well, especially in a pandemic crisis, uh, which uh, mixes not only the cycle, but also uh, structural elements. And uh, therefore, I think the reflection of inflation in our advanced economies has to be made broader. It has also to go into the direction uh, uh, to what extent we will have structural changes. Um, what is the, um, the uh, effect 
of the crisis also on the natural rate uh, of um, uh, interest rate, uh, what uh, does it mean for the transmission mechanism of uh, the monetary policy on the inflation, the relation between inflation and output seems also to have changed uh, in a low uh, growth environment. Uh, we were used to have low inflation attributed mostly to global value chains. These value chains are now being disrupted to some extent. How will they be replaced? What will be the effect on inflation? This is an extremely rich discussion that is ongoing and uh, due to the pandemic, we have a wealth of documents that I have never seen before from all the academics, uh, but also researchers and analysts, uh, which uh, helps us also because we also decided that there, are, there might be structural breaks. So we cannot continue to change ghosts, which do not exist anymore. So that is why we started the uh, review of our strategy. And in this strategy review, we also discuss all these elements on the transmission, on inflation, uh, how are the instruments, are our instruments still having the same traction on price developments that they had in the past? Um, how is the flattening of the uh, Phillips curve uh, being also uh, affected? You see, this is a very broad discussion that would be uh, filling a, a whole discussion uh, twice mm. as long as the one we have today. Mm. Uh, but we do not shy away from uh, having this discussion because uh, we might feel that the, tra the traditional ways of analysis uh, might uh, not lead us to the uh, proper conclusions. The, now, the, that whole review of monetary policy strategy uh, is it takes as given the existing treaty framework um, but i think i saw you mentioning somewhere some idea that there might be a scope or, or, or desirability of some kind of treaty change to uh, to take account of the new instruments that have been developed including the the pandemic uh, purchase program which has some slightly different features as you mentioned uh, including you know relaxing it, it doesn't have to be strictly according to the uh, capital key the purchase could be could vary a little bit from from country to country C could you say a little bit more about what, what you have yeah. in mind in terms of treaty change there because after various <laughs> referenda everybody gets alarmed about the prospect of a, a treaty change discussion uh, I think, Patrick, you know me long enough that uh, you believe that I did not uh, imply that we would give up our red lines, that we would move into monetary financing uh, or uh, bailing out everyone around the world. No, uh, that's not what was intended. Uh, what I said is if we have in a low growth and low inflation environment, necessarily a closer uh, need for um, having monetary policy and fiscal policy complement each other. Uh, then uh, we would also need to have efficiency and the efficiency of fiscal policy is so much higher if we have it at the European level than if we only have it at the national level. And I always said that it is not normal that a centralized single monetary policy would buy local government debt and by local, I mean national government debt. But as all jurisdictions, we would only operate uh, through federal debt. And we do not have that federal debt. But in order to have a federal debt, you also need to uh, change the treaty because the treaty says exactly the contrary, that uh, fiscal policy is a national competence. And only the consequence of fiscal policy, the debt, uh, can then be assessed at the European level. But if we want to have a European debt, then we need also a higher amount of European democracy. Otherwise, you disenfranchise the citizens because the citizens can influence with his vote the national parliament which controls the government's debt. The European parliament has no such capacity to create taxation. Taxation is a national competence. So if we want to have European debt, we also need to transfer some powers to the European Parliament, and that needs treaty change. 
This cannot be done through the back door. That is a kind of treaty change of logic that I uh, mentioned. If you have a fiscal uh, safe, uh, if you have a safe asset at European level, if you have a fiscal capacity at European level, you must also have democratic control, parliamentary control at European level. If you have that at European level, the citizens must be able to increase its choice of representation at the European level. So the whole thing of debt is the same as the thing of taxation and is the same as parliamentary control, and that's democracy. And we cannot simply transfer to the European level one area and not the other area. Let's move to the more technical issue uh, that we said we would talk about of digital money. Um, the ECB published, I think, about 10 days ago, maybe roughly that then, um, a major report on central bank digital currency as a, a digital euro that might be issued by the European Central Bank. It wasn't saying it would, go, would happen. It was, um, it's a very interesting uh, perspective of the issues that arise and the sort of principles that might have to be adopted if the ECB were to go down that route. You think this is something that's going to happen in the next number of years? Uh, and what are the challenges? I think uh, it's an issue that is extremely broad, and it's not an issue that is uh, one that has been brought up uh, by the ECB. It is something that has been discussed at the global level already, and which has received a certain or seen a certain acceleration with the development of private initiatives, uh, which were aiming at replacing central bank money with private money. And uh, there we became alarmed and we say, uh, if that is really something that our citizens would like, we have to see why. And the answer at the global level, it, including a report that has been done by the G7 or the G20 and the FSB, and they have all been looking into this matter. And our report is to a large extent reflecting the consensus among the larger advanced economies on this matter that we should not let uh, private currencies uh, de-anchor national currencies or, or single currencies, which for Europe is then the national currency. So um, from that point of view, I would not say this is a decision to move to that situation, but it is a, a decision to be ready if there are certain scenarios that would be unfolding. One scenario being that the citizens would not accept cash anymore, which is far from what we see. We see on the country that the amount of uh, demand for cash has increased during the crisis and not decreased. But we, on the other hand, we also see that the amount of transactions for payments in cash has decreased and the digital um, use has increased. Now, there is another element to it. Europe does not have a Europe-wide payment instrument. The payment instruments are either national or they are uh, credit cards from another jurisdiction. That is also a consideration. And a third consideration is um, that we have with Facebook or Libra uh, initiatives uh, which are ready to start and which we consider could be highly disruptive if they would uh, start without uh, respecting a properly established regulatory framework that would respect uh, European sovereignty, that would respect uh, the safety and the efficiency of payment systems, which is a basic task for the central bank inscribed in the treaty. So, and then there is an additional element, and that is if foreign jurisdictions would start a digital currency and try to distribute it to European citizens, and we would not have the equivalent to offer. There would not be competition, but there would be a threat to the national currency. So these are the different uh, basic um, starting points uh, which prompted an increased uh, interest with the subject and uh, which prompted us to publish this report uh, which only says these are the possibilities, these are the scenarios. 
But then we also see that there are risks which come with the different possibilities of a central bank digital currency. There are risks for the banking system, uh, there are risks for the privacy of uh, people's uh, transactions. Um, there are different risks uh, that you could consider, and this is what we are now trying to deep drill down and study in order, uh, if the situation arises, that we can come up with a rapid response to uh, the new requests by our citizens. It could, uh, it could involve an enormous amount of, of new technology being used by the central banks and, and reaching out to a much larger uh, client base, if you like, than, than is imagined today. Uh, of, of course, the ECB has some hundreds of, of, of counterparties, but then it would be millions or, or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions. Uh, so it, it would be a huge step for a central bank to, um, to, to go down that route. Technology today allows it. Uh, we have also the platforms uh, which could be uh, scaled up. So it is less a technological problem, it's more a policy problem. Because if we would undermine an uh, economy that is financed by deposits uh, of uh, the citizens in the banks, and the banks use these deposits to finance the economy and do the risk assessment for the allocation of capital, this model uh, could be undermined uh, if we would uh, have an alternative of central bank deposits uh, that would diminish the deposit in the private banks and thereby could even increase the cost of intermediation and thereby the cost to finance the economy. So uh, I, this is all acknowledged and this is exactly a part of the design features that we have to see. What are the advantages of a certain design? We could cap the amount of uh, central bank digital currency that would be available for each citizen. We could say it is not in an account, it's not account based, but it's a uh, bearer based uh, that is more like uh, uh, banknotes. Uh, I think the easiest way uh, is always to do something which is as close as possible to what people know, and that is banknotes. If we would have a digital representation of a banknote, we would not undermine uh, any bank account and any deposit in any commercial bank. So, um, but this is yet to be uh, discussed. Uh, these are the different models that are on the table and we have to see what is the best response and the best response to what situation. Because we first have to see the situation to which we want to respond before uh, rolling out the design. And as you say, the, the practices and behaviors are quite different in different parts of the, of the Euro area and the European Union, even more widely. In some parts, huge use of, of banknotes, not just in, in, during the pandemic, but use of banknotes to buy cars, which seems extraordinary to us yeah. in Dublin. But then in other parts, uh, hardly, you hardly see a banknote anymore. Um, it is curious the way the number of, of banknotes in circulation has increased during the crisis. I, I wonder, is it because people are always ready to accept money, but they don't want to handle it, so they're just putting it on a shelf. They're not losing any interest. Other people say it's uh, nefarious. Uh, it's, it's harder, harder for, for drug dealers to, to launder their illicit gains, but um, it, it's, I suppose we'll, we'll never get to the bottom of, of why there's an increase in the circulation of money during this pandemic. <laughs> You know, the relation to money uh, sometimes goes beyond the borders of rationalism. And we have to <laughs> live with that. So even if the banks are not um, made completely redundant by, um, by digital money, um, or, or if they are not, we we'll still have bankers with us. And, and I know that's a topic that you, you've been interested in, is, is how to hold bankers to a high standard of, of responsibility. Um, what what are the has there been any progress there since the crisis of 2008-9, uh, where so many bankers were uh, might have been held responsible for some of the things that went wrong, and, and yet uh, dissatisfaction on the part of the general public about how this was dealt with. Well, uh, there are the bankers and there are the institutions. Let's first start with the institutions. Uh, after the crisis uh, in 2008 and 11, we forced banks uh, to hold much more capital and by 
By that, we also lower their profitability per each uh, euro. So uh, this time around, we went into a crisis with a, a capital level of uh, above 15%. This compares to a capital level of uh, barely a little bit over half of this 8% uh, when we went into the 2008 crisis. And even in 2011, we did not have enough um, capital. So the capital buffers of the banks, uh, which absorbs the losses that come with uh, a return of the cycle, uh, has been this times much larger and uh, thereby it was even further reinforced by some of the measures we took in order to keep the capital inside the banks. For example, uh, by saying we do not give you relief measures uh, in order to increase the dividend payouts. Mm. So the dividends have to be retained, uh, but we also uh, had at the same moment the moratoria and the public guarantees which also help the banks uh, to protect to some extent um, a complete uh, turnaround and souring of all the assets. But that does not mean that uh, we can continue to freeze the situation as, it, as we have done now forever. Because uh, in a free market economy, obviously, uh, there needs to be destruction. There needs to be also a reallocation of resources, both capital but also labor to the most efficient uh, segment of the market and not to otherwise we will have large scale zombification, which would lead to even lower growth and uh, even more difficulties in our economy. So the only problem is uh, from what moment on do we move from the support measures that we still have now and which in my opinion are still necessary, both in monetary policy and in um, in fiscal side, to a situation where we need uh, to let the market forces uh, play their role and shift the resources to the more efficient parts of the economy, because inevitably we will not return to the old normal. We will not return to the different sectors playing the same role as they played uh, before the crisis. Some sectors in that inevitably uh, will undergo deep structural changes, and we cannot oppose it unless we pay for it with lower growth.